And please interrupt at any time with your, uh, your, your own opinions, because they're probably better than mine. Um, OK, uh, topics. Um, a wild and reckless use. So we started doing this shtick. Good Lord, how old is CNI at this point? Um, 1990. 1990. So uh, Paul Evan Peter started inviting me to cover this waterfront a long time ago. Um, and so I was, uh, I was there at the start, and we'll talk a little bit about that, and then some of the successes and changes. And then over the last several years, there's been a number of challenges um, in the internet identity space, from new technologies to new laws. Um, we'll cover some of those challenges, to the, just the fact that successes really help. I mean, if this had just kind of fallen over and died, you know, I wouldn't be here, and, and you'd still have 4,000 passwords, and well, actually, one password for 4,000 different sites, and um, life would be pretty dark. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, and then the coming of age. So the current issues that we're wrestling with in internet identity, um, we'll cover some of those. Um, and um, we'll wind up with the usual sets of uh, fearless and foolish predictions. And again, at any particular point, just say, that's not true, and I'll, 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 I'll fluster. OK, um, so we started in this biz around uh, 2000. Um, um, at Internet 2, we started with an RNA-driven focus for inter-realm authentication um, and authorization to support collaboration. At the same time, the feds were doing PKI and, you know, handing out your shirts, and of course, Berkeley will do exactly the right behavior so that you can make these um, uh, technologies work. And it wasn't the technologies, it was the policies that were difficult, um, especially at Berkeley. I'm a graduate. Uh, don't let the Alumni Association know, Jen. Um, but, uh, um, um, and we had a collaboration orientation, um, and then that became commercial to commercial relationships, and then it became a consumer uh, identity um, and social identity foundation. Um, it's now moving yet again into a new, a new world, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so we met from a very hierarchical PKI space. Here's the global policy. You will enforce that policy locally. You will wrestle all of your difficult people into this. Uh, that you, will, you will take all of your policy makers and convince them to do different policies so you can fit to the global hierarchy. That didn't work. Um, so it was globally scalable but not locally deployable. We knew Federation was locally deployable because we said, just, just tell us what you're doing. Keep it on. Do what you're doing. Um, we didn't know if it uh, was globally scalable. I got to confess that now, 20 years in, I'm not sure that it's going to be globally scalable because we're meeting lots of challenges in terms of distinct privacy laws across the globe, um, new forces out there, and frankly, semantics is a problem. Uh, you know, the example I use a lot is that in the UK, um, there's only uh, uh, staff and students as categories of worker bees. We have faculty. What happens when we send an insertion that says faculty to the UK? What do they do with that? Mumble, mumble. Um, so we got into a federated identity for authenticate locally, act globally was our model. And then we added the attributes because we were really privacy preserving. It was this community in particular, the libraries, that made us really emphasize the fact that when when in doubt, we weren't going to send identity, we were going to send attributes, faculty, student, enrolled in class 101, whatever. Um, that uh, turned out to be huge for uh, uh, privacy and access control. There would have been no privacy and access control with PKI. Um, along the way, we um, tried to ratchet up the trust model. So we began back in 2001 or two with Clubship, a place you'd like to visit. Um, and then we moved to NQ because we knew we had to get a little bit more um, um, rigorous. And then finally we're in common. And in common is about to tighten the screws on the members. Because if we're really going to work globally, if we're going to really trust each other, then we've got to have a bit more um, in common as we about how we operate. Um, from the US to global, and we started with refeds. Um, which was the RNE federations globally. 
Um, and we went from the, bi the business of custom big dogs, so this got started with Stanford and Berkeley and CMU and MIT, um, and now it's ubiquity, and now it's cloud services, and now um, very small places need to do this, K-12 needs to do this, they're not gonna, they're not gonna suck it in and run these technologies, they're gonna buy the services in the cloud. Um, and along the way, we switched our programming language from SAML to JSON, something else is coming along, the language changes, the ideas don't. So, what are we facing now? We're too successful. <coughs> the size of the metadata bundle is huge and growing. It takes three gigabits, three gigabytes of memory in a cloud to store the metadata that we started to distribute. It takes four hours to load. This isn't good, folks. This is too much success. Um, it also makes uh, IDP discovery um, um, hard. Uh, we, have, uh, we have people in this room who suffer that pain every day um, of trying to get, uh, um, you know, I can pull, show you, pull down a list of IDPs that are just two point font at this point to get them onto six pages. You know, it's just brutal. It's not the way we're gonna do this going forward. And in fact, uh, some people in the room are looking at other approaches for that. Um, it's a big and diverse world. Um, everybody needs identity. It's kind of like the network. You know, it's what connects. Um, and um, we have to integrate with other forms of identity. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, just came from a very interesting meeting about that. An increasing spectrum of skills and interests to serve. Um, um, again, the cutting edge, you know, back when we started, I just hung out with 20 really smart people and we, you know, did whiteboards and life was cool. And now it's, it's, um, it's people who don't live and breathe identity, thank God. And so they need to, uh, we need to accommodate that. Um, internationally, from the original big feds to a growing set of new countries, um, we just got the application today, or last week actually, in refeds for the Russian Federation to join. Interesting. What do some of these concepts mean? Uh, the Chinese Federation is joined. What do these concepts mean there? Um, and this one is um, sweeping up after our mess, moving from skinny to fat trust profiles. So initially, um, we said again, you know, we're, we're going to kind of trust what you do there at Berkeley. Uh, even though I was a student there, I still am going to trust it. Um, but um, that's not going to work going forward. Um, and so um, we need to flesh out some common approaches. Um, and in general in this biz, in all of the technology biz, in any of the standard stuff, and it probably applies uh, to um, semantic and syntactic standards as well as the stuff that we deal with at the uh, protocol level, um, you want to make these things very general which means it's the profiles that make all the difference in the world. We've got 19 knobs on, on, on SAML. It's how you turn the various ones that make it possible for me to actually understand what you're sending. Um, so, we're all, um, so we're all moving from these skinny profiles that specified very little, um, where it was easy to meet it, but I'm not sure I'm gonna trust you because I don't know a lot of the things you're doing. Um, now we're moving to much fatter profiles, profiles that um, may be a little bit harder to meet, but in fact, if you meet them, then I'm gonna have more confidence that what you're saying is trustworthy. So here's what the coming of age looks like. We'll start with uh, dynamic metadata and discovery. There's a pernicious interaction between those two. Um, the integration of identities, um, GDPR, um, attribute release, um, where consent fits in that, baseline expectations, which are leveling, moving to those uh, um, fatter trust profiles, some of the back end threats, and then I'm, just because all of this stuff is going to be humbled by what happens when ransomware hits things. Um, I got to talk a little bit about that. There's a connection between identity and things that we have to flesh out. And as I talk to my colleagues in business, they're much better positioned to do so than we are in um, academia because 
we don't know who has what things on campus. Whereas in a business, you know what's been acquired. I don't know what acquisitions are like on your campus, but my God, anybody can acquire a thing. And, and uh, it gets really tricky. So, dynamic metadata and discovery. Um, so, as, as I indicated, the Federation metadata files are too big to begin with, and now we're asking people to add more metadata. Those logos you didn't put in there, we need those logos to help Todd's discovery process, that those security contacts that you didn't put in there, I want to know if there's an incident, who do I contact um, at, a, at a campus to get the relief from that. Um, so we're asking people to add more to the metadata files. They're getting very big, so we're moving from Etsy host to DNS. Very few people in this room. Thank you for the smile, Cliff. Uh, very few people remember NC hosts, but that's the old way we used to distribute the IP tables. Um, the protocols and code now exist for all of this stuff. There's some experimentation starting. Um, federations will likely construct some common bundles uh, for ease of deployment. So in, in, in common, with about almost a thousand members now, we import probably 4,000 other members globally from Educate. Um, an indication of the growth in the size. We will probably bundle um, just the in common participants in one bundle because there's a number of places that are going to have different rules for international stuff. Um, so discovery is the process of helping a user find their identity provider. Um, there's active work that uh, um, Todd is certainly um, engaged with in RA21 to um, solve this uh, discovery problem. It's a, you know, it's not chronic, but it's the first step of the process. And so if you can't do that, you're doomed. But once you do that, it's, it, it doesn't have much scale associated with it. Um, there's some browser assist, there's a central discovery process uh, service, um, and pull downs, the pilots are starting, and all of these um, tests, they all have good aspects and tricky aspects. And tricky aspects largely to do with privacy, um, and the disparity among how browsers do things. Um, and all that will probably be compounded by GDPR because GDPR is going to compound everything. Um, and then there's an interplay between the two. So <coughs> most sites today will take like, the, oh, I don't know, the Jeon site has probably 2,000 IDPs on it. Um, they do that by taking this massive um, bundle of data and listing all the IDPs. Well, there isn't going to be a massive bundle of data anymore. How are they going to list those IDPs? Well, I'm going to look at one of those other approaches. But our move to dynamic metadata, which we have to do, is going to compound the discovery process of pain that Todd knows well. OK. Um, integration of identities. So federated identity has gotten deep traction. And thankfully, MFA is really coming along. Um, so um, it's gotten very um, convenient um, because we're all carrying cell phones, because cell phone service is so good. We've all learned the workarounds if you're in the hospital room and you can't get the uh, uh, telephone signal, there's workarounds, or if you're on, a, on an archaeological dig in East Africa, there's workarounds. I think we're mastering MFA and it's very good um, certainly the number of attack vectors um, um, using um, username password has decreased partially because there's so many of the good attack vectors to go after these days and we'll talk about some of them um, but um, MFA has certainly um, cut down on those uh, those phishing attacks um, the integration of social identity and federated identity is happening. So the social identity courtesy of uh, Google and Facebook um, is certainly moving along. Um, uh, maybe, maybe it's gotten a little bit of a bump, hopefully in the road. Um, but those gateways exist. Um, we in, this U in the U.S. use a lot of social to SAML gateways. So those parents can check on student accounts and student bills by using a social identity to get to the SAML. Um, base um, um, student information systems and student finance systems. Um, SAML, the social gateways, um, also exist in, ironic in Japan, there's a lot more SAML uh, identity and people are using their 
uh, campus identities and corporate identities to get into the social realm. There's still tricky management there of self-asserted versus um, the, uh, uh, vetted uh, enterprise attributes. So if I'm going to accept your social identity into my world, what attributes about your social identity am I going to trust over what I might have it, hopefully, uh, in, in house? Well, I certainly think you're probably better, or you're more authoritative on nickname, and so aware of that, and maybe a few other things. Maybe you're more up to date on address, but I'm not sure I would want to accept um, citizenship as self assert That could be really, really tricky. Well, especially when we have business processes on our campus that capture citizenship, at least for you know, service and other kinds of processes for campuses. Sovereign identity is the new beast on the block. And last week I was at a meeting at, uh, at the Computer History Museum that was just teeming with sovereign identity people. Um, these are long-held desires um, on the part of a lot of people to say, I don't need no stinking badges but my own. Um, and they didn't have any good technologies to work with, but they still wanted to put their money and their identity under the mattress. And that's what this does. And then blockchains come along. Blockchains make this easily viable for some definition of easily viable. And it's, a, it's a game changer um, in that um, I can construct um, blockchains of trust um, through that, that distributed ledger um, that um, they're really solid technologies. The crypto is good. Um, but um, there's, um, there's a couple of challenges here. Um, one is um, scale. This will not globally scale. It just won't. But those people don't want it to globally scale. They want circles of trust that somehow merge together. Um, secondly is privacy. The blockchain is public. So every transaction is public. So who signed what is I don't know how that's going to fit into different spaces that value privacy. Um, perhaps the, the hardest part um, about this is that these are people who, um, by their nature, don't trust institutions, don't necessarily trust each other. So who's going to be in charge of the mob? So there is a, you know, this is, you know, this goes back to George Bernard Shaw jokes, you know, that, that, this kind of stuff. Um, so sovereign.org, S-O-V-R-I-N.org, is kind of the gathering place for this. And um, at the meeting last week of uh, 200 identity geeks, I'd say probably um, easily a third were um, associated with sovereign. Many of them come from you. And I asked somebody in the know, and it said something about the relationship between the Mormon church and Solomon. Yeah. I don't know. We need a crusading reporter to dive into this uh, um, and find it out. But it was a very interesting, um, very interesting um, connection. Um, they were redoing the entire identity stuff. Um, so we, the way we use the OAuth, they have to create something equivalent to that, etc. So they're reinventing stuff, and they're not integrated much at all into um, the existing internet identity space. So where um, um, uh, SAML and OpenID Connect um, have um, have um, learned how to leverage each other, Sovereign isn't in there. By the way, um, just uh, uh, someone told me recently, uh, I think last week, that if you, if you look at searches at Google, um, SAML dominates OpenID Connect for you. And a couple of years ago, we were all scurrying to build all the OpenID Connect stuff, we need mobility, um, it has a clear space in, in our world, but it didn't displace SAML, it added to the internet identity suite. The question of how this looks going forward, um, uh, I don't know where Sovereign plays in all this, I don't know. Um, and then there's roles of special identities um, as well. So the ORCID identity remains as a luscious topic 
It's persistent. You know, it never changes. It follows you from institution to institution. We can kind of add good, good, good strength to that um, uh, authentication process. Is we. So can we use it for something beyond its intended purposes? Well, thankfully, the investors in ORCID have stayed pretty well focused on this is a disambiguation tool for the scholarly community and have not been tempted by, I'll take Globus as an example. Globus is just, would love to use um, the open identifier as, as, as your gateway into um, high performance. And, and by the way, would you tweak all it a little bit so that it would fit better into high performance computing? And that's when you start to, 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 to wonder about purposes. Any questions so far? Nobody's left, so I guess we'll. Well, I have a dumb question. Explain to me exactly it's the sovereign identity. Is this the idea that I own my own identity, period, and carry it with me wherever I go? Yeah, well, you, you know, right. So, so it certainly has, you know, we know in the federated space if you go from one campus to another, it's right. right. Um If you go from Gmail to Facebook, it's open. Right. Sovereign, you own. Did anybody else find it? But it is, um, again, if you go to sovereign.org, there, there is a polemic, I'm sorry, there is a, a narrative up there that is glowing with um, the glories of sovereign identity. And, you know, again, um, frankly, given the abuses that are happening out there with uh, Facebook and, and, and uh, Google, um, there's a real temptation. We will get to in the talk is there's going to be greater abuses than anything we've seen so far, and so maybe we're not looking at the right problem. So um, GDPR, um, cool stuff. I I I like it because um, first of all, the U.S. has nothing like this in terms of privacy space. I like it because it took 20 or 30 different policy frameworks in Europe to make it uniform. So it moved, the most important word here is the move from directive to regulation. Directive say interpret as you see fit. Regulation says it gets solved at the EU level, not at the state or national level. It's binding on every member, and more so. Um, it's, uh, so when we send our students to study abroad, they're gonna be governed by GDPR. When the faculty member steps foot in Europe, on a business trip, they're covered by GDPR. Um, um, when that faculty member comes, uh, let's see, comes to the U.S., uh, there's coverage as well. Um, so um, it was passed in 2016. It becomes operational in just about a month. In fact, I've been told it's operational already. It's just not enforceable. Policies will become operative in um, 2018. It covers a vast waterfront of issues. Um, a whole lot of stuff. Um, I'll cover some of those in a second. Um, it consists of a set of articles, um, which you know some of us can quote chapter and verse, and then example interpretations of those rules, those are called recitations. And now, as the rubber hits the road, a lot of the questions are being referred back to this Article 29 working group that preceded any of the GDPR, and they're the ones who are actually going to define such gnarly details as what I'm about to get to. Um, the penalties are huge, 4% of global revenue. The EU has demonstrated they can collect that money. They fined Google um, a big fine. I'm seeing some people smile. And you know, um, Google Mountain View didn't know about, well, they knew about it, certainly. But it was Google.fr that pummeled up the money. Um, um, there are six reasons for attribute release, um, and it gets really tricky. Um, this is one of the things we're working on right now. Um, I'm in the attribute release biz. Um, a single site, like a wiki, will have several different reasons for releasing different attributes to that site. So your login name gets released because things can't function. That's called legitimate interest. Um, other things get released because of national security purposes. 
like the log files become accessible to the wiki owner if there's some kind of malfeasance. <coughs> but your display name, because you want it to look pretty for your poster that you put onto that wiki, that becomes consent. Because it's not required, it's optional. There's a nice rule of thumb that somebody gave, and I don't think it's quite true, but it's useful, which is if you can lie about it and still use the site, then it becomes consent or rule of thumb. Um, and it affects, uh, I think, all of us. So this is uh, Daniel Solov is a George Washington University professor and lawyer. He's done this wonderful chart about this, and this is uh, Creative Commons, so I can use it all. Um, um, some of these things are, um, are all noble. A lot of these things need to be fleshed out. Here's the territorial scope issue. Um, here are the reasons for processing data. Um, um, transparency, access, and rectification. Right to erasure. I'm going to come back to that in a second because what am I going to do about all those network backups that I've done? How do I wish you had backups? Um, enforcement, we talked about already. Um, da -da -da -da. Um, sensitive data, I'll come back to in just a second as well. No only details. So almost everything is, is, is PII in this definition. Your IP address is PII. Unless you can prove it was dynamically assigned, they assume that it's static, and so it becomes PII. Um, um, some identifiers are, are you know, exempt because we engineered them right. And then there's the sensitive PII, um, which is actually, there's another word that they're using, special categories um, uh, for that. And these are going to become very tricky for us to handle. And we just discovered that it's Article 29 that's going to do that. So let me give you a poignant example um, of this. Um, if we had thought this sucker was going to fly 20 years ago when we started, we wouldn't have stuck all of your group memberships into one attribute called is member of. But we did that because the sucker wasn't going to fly. So now there are places that have all your group memberships in one attribute and we have an all or nothing lease mechanism. So I'll take people at Brown University. Many people, where they turned group management loose, almost everybody belongs to hundreds of groups. Somebody says, I need group membership. How about a couple of hundred? No, no, what are we supposed to be privacy preserving? So we're learning about how to handle this. And one of the inklings that we think of in the special categories of GDPR is that we're going to have to obfuscate some of these values. Not so much that you can't figure out what that value is, but perchance if you're looking at it on a screen and somebody else can look at it, it's obfuscated. So just the way that passwords get dots and then you can click there to see it open, we're going to have to do the same thing, we think. We're engineering the UI right now. And it's going to be doubly problematic. Um, because passwords are fairly short. Some of our boot names are hundreds of characters. Erin Cole and Mace Cole, Maxit, Maxit, blah, 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 blah. How do I obfuscate that where you can recognize, oh, that's LGBT in the middle of that, but how do you? We've got some UI issues that we're just wrestling with. Um, research data use. Um, fortunately, um, there, ha there are explicit exemptions in GDPR about um, um, uh, research data use. So all the epidemiological stuff that uh, people want to do for re uh, with research data, um, mm, uh, there are some, uh, that has to be fleshed out, but at least there's some mechanisms in place that can happen. A right to be forgotten, as I mentioned, cloud-based backups. How do I do that? Um, um, and they also call for about data portability. Well, I mean, all of my consent decisions need to be portable if I take my identity provided. Yeah. So we're going to be back to, I think, um, um, RTF was uh, comma separated values. Well, how do we make these portable? Uh, I don't know. A data breach notification, uh, 22 hour, uh, 72 hours. Um, this call may be recorded. Can't do that anymore. Or you have to give people the ability to move forward without it being recorded. Um, 
um, data protection officers and individual data protection training. Uh, I know that some of the larger schools are actually starting to do data protection, um, individual data protection training, and Solov um, has developed a set of courses around that. Okay, um, attribute release. So um, we never expected um, that it was going to be this hard to get attributes out of the institutions. We call, we call the universities attribute protective universities. They are a legion out there. It's typically no offense to any petty registrar that's here, but there's a registrar there who's just dug his heels in. Um, and at least dug his heels in for students, and then graduate students become critical in all this because they're going to help the researcher do his research, but they're students and gets ornery. Um, um, and so um, I've been working on stuff, I, I'll show you a, a slide or two um, on explicit consent. Um, um, we haven't started to promote it widely because we're still bashing our head against the wall of research and scholarship. We want you to, we want the university to label itself um, and consider itself that if a site is attesting that it is a relying party that is RNS based, that the university will release um, your login name and, and uh, that's basically it, your EPPN. Um, and um, your adoption is growing, but glacially, it's really frustrating. And Globus just walked away from this last week. So we've, we've given up hope. Um, they did cite consent as an answer to this, and I'm trying, still trying to promote that. Um, international. So we took, RNS began in the U.S., it went international, and suddenly there were lots of universities that go, well, I trust my U.S. colleagues, they're international. Moldavia, hmm, if they're asserting RNS, well, I trust Moldavia. Albania is the prime example of, uh, you know, uh, problematic spaces. So there's a lot happening now in consent as a remedy to this, as a GDPR alternative. There's a Qatar working group here. This one uh, is really fascinating. Um, it's the Interactive Advertising Bureau. All those ads that you see on any one site is being coordinated by IAB. I used to know IAB as the Internet Activities Board. This is, in fact, the Interactive uh, advertising Bureau and um, uh, Todd and I were just talking about this based upon a business model that is now legal as of the truth. So these people are defining cookies in a way, in particular, it's around the purpose for the use of the released information. That is the really gnarly thing. And I have seen taxonomies on purpose of use which would allow some downstream party to go, oh, oh I'm, I'm consistent with that, I'm gonna use the same data, give it to me. Um, and those purposes of use are um, heavily marketing oriented. They're not gonna work for our community. Um, yes, you consented to being on a mail list and to receive ads, but you didn't consent to um, you know, third party, whatever it is. Um, and it's fine grained stuff and they're setting bit by bit on cookies and all of the cookies in your web browser, as of May 25th, will have a different format where the bits are being specified so that people can still do cross-cookie, um, cross-site activities using those cookies, using purpose fields that are, I mean, these people are meeting daily to try to narrow down thousands of possible business purposes into a manageable set. Um, scary stuff. Um, and then um, there is the car stuff I've been working on. I'll, I'll show you a slide or two of that. Um, it's consent informed attribute release. Um, originally funded by NIST when NIST, like any federal agency, had enough people to turn the lights on. Um, you know, it's a different space now. Um, it's a multi protocol consent as a service. Um, and it, the emphasis is really on informed consent. It's not just consent, it's informed consent. So we have an architecture that is multi-protocol, so um, there's a relying party, there's, uh, we can serve OAuth, we can serve um, SHIB, we can serve OIDC, 
we can combine institutional reasons for policy release with user preferences for that and, um, um, and then spit out records associated with this, allow the user to make decisions, and then we envision, in fact, we actually have it, um, another um, application on your phone, um, like settings, which will be called Where's My Stuff Dude, um, which is basically all of my consent decisions. And I can go in there and I can manage them, I can replicate them, I can say, you know, for sites that have similar tags associated with them, I want to use the same policies. The hardest part of all of this stuff, and, and, and there's an enterprise management console which gives me a lot of excitement because I, as an IDP operator, let's say I'm, operate, I'm Jeremy Rosenberg operating the IDP at Berkeley, and I notice a site has changed its privacy policy, and I want all the users to reconsent. I can do that with a single command. So there's some nice stuff in our enterprise management. The hardest part is getting informed content. Stuff so that you can make an effective decision and make it effect and, and make it in reasonable time. So we look a lot at how long it takes you to look at something. We call that dwell time. If it's less than a second, something went wrong. You did your eyes glazed and you just clicked through. If it took more than 20 seconds, something went wrong, we didn't make it clear. So there's a narrow window of understanding that we're trying to aim for there to get good consent. So the screens look like this, nice greens, nice reds for denies. This was designed by Duke, by the way. They're, they're awfully good about it. Um, we're going to make consent painful enough one time that we'd like to be able to have you suppress it. And so we have these buttons. Show, save my choices. Don't show me this screen again unless necessary. What's necessary? Well, maybe the privacy policy changed at the line party. Maybe the value I'm releasing has changed. The system admin can decide what's necessary and trigger a reconsent decision. Save my choices, but show me the screen again. Don't save those choices. Um, that was put in there so that I didn't kill demos by saving my choices and then I couldn't re you know, re redo those again. These boxes change by context. Um, interestingly, um, um, the Danes have been doing this for quite some time, eight to ten years, because of their architecture. Um, they're ca they're, they have statistics on dwell time, statistics on how often people check each of these choices, um, and what we're seeing is that there's a considerable percentage that makes the same choice every time but wants to see it again. It's a source of comfort. Uh, the Danes are different than the U.S. All mileage may vary. We may not get miles at all. Um, this is where I go to my show me my stuff dude consent manager. And if I go there, I get to see all of my release policies per, for all my sites. And um, I can drill in, see the attributes being released, see the values of those releasing so I can clean this up if that's if needed. Um, here's my current choices, um, and then um, in this case the organization, the enterprise, can recommend stuff. Um, and you see the standard choices, and then you see um, ask me and while I'm away. So one of the oddities of campuses, and I'm sure that the, the schools here fit this, is the registrar is guarding the transactional attribute release. Oh, 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 I want to consent. But it's not watching in all the batch flows of information. And it's exactly the same stuff that's moving from one system to another without any consent or any filtering. If you set FERPA, I'll tell you the batch flows don't know about that. So the side door and the back door are wide open even as you're monitoring the, the inline stuff. This gives us the ability to take a batch file, run it through there, and say, oh, you're FERPA protected. We're not going to lose. You, you know. So there's some very interesting things. We added this not because we were freaks about FERPA, but because this is intrinsic to the open ID OAuth world where consent persists from um, um, moment to moment. Baseline expectations. Let me see how I'm doing on time. Okay. 
Um, so as I indicated, we began with Club Shib. Um, it was, you know, I'm going to trust Stanford. I'm going to trust Berkeley. Um, and now I'm getting all these other places. So we're moving from ad hoc trust towards a set of common expectations. Um, it makes a baseline for trust. Um, um, and it, what does it address? Well, I want to make sure that you're patching your software. Good hygiene. Um, I want to make sure that the people operating your identity management system um, are actually authorized to operate your identity management system. Um, I want to make sure that you're maintaining your federated metadata. I want to make sure that when you receive attributes, you um, handle them properly and then dispose of them. Um, and if there's some kind of federated incident handling, you're going to be responsive. And, you know, the people at CERN are very concerned about this. You know, you could do real damage. And so they're studying real time frames that say, God, if an account got, you know, if we sense something malicious happening and we contact um, the University of Southern California and say, one of your users is doing malicious things, we want to know you're going to respond. Um, it's being advanced in stages. This is totally new ground. Um, it, it involves consensus building on where the, what the policies are, and then deployment. And now we're trying to deal with, OK, there's a reporting um, um, failure to comply. What do we do? We have never, ever, in 15 years of federation, kicked out somebody from the federation. And so the steering committee is sitting there going, gulp. Going to really do that. We're going to disable the university from, you know, because all of your services now, especially in the cloud, are coming in through federated identity. Do we really have the courage to do this? How do we reinstate you? How do we know that you're uh, you're doing it well? Um, important stuff to follow. It's going to it's taking a while, but it's a sea change. So um, just uh, a, a comment or two about current events. Um, the back-end threats that we're seeing now, um, we can't fix through technology. So the back-end threats, Cambridge Analytica, et cetera, that was the failure of Facebook to police a policy. We can't do anything technically about that. Um, but we can manage the front-end threats, um, managing what data the, York, the relying party gets, um, making some of these consent dialogues a bit more clear, they're utterly opaque. Um, and um, this one's going to be very hard. So um, if you have an old Android phone like I do, Google gives me the choice when I load a new application of accepting all of the attribute release or none of them. Apple's a bit better, it gives me some controls over it. But nobody's good at it. Nobody tells me what's the damage if I choose not to release a particular attribute. There isn't any normalization around that in the community. And so we really, data minimization, which is absolutely stipulated in GDPR, is going to be one of the more interesting frontiers over the next uh, year or two, is how we as a community agree on this stuff. I had a fascinating conversation with um, Adobe last week. Um, they're an IDP through Adobe Connect and lots of other services. Half a billion accounts, that was humbling. They were putting consent screens in front of everything. As of May 25th, just the way you see those annoying little, this, you, this site sets cookies, you're going to see annoying little consent dialogues. All work here is done. Um, but um, um, those consent dialogues are going to be are challenging because we don't know um, in particular how to handle the data minimization. Ah, okay. We're moving to wrap ups. Um, so I've gotten involved in the Internet of Things, and boy, is this huge and really hard. So the security vulnerabilities are staggering. I have a list. So the, the um, mirror by attack of last year, which was basically webcams around the world attacking lots of sites. Those are continuing, by the way. It's just that the publicity has gone underground. The ransoms are being paid. Um, it's, um, 
um, the people commanding these sites, uh, these uh, uh, bot attacks, um, are making really good money, which is why the uh, password sniffing has gone away, because you can make a lot more money doing this. You can get a lot of money from um, um, a lot of these, uh, you know, Westinghouse or GE, when you say, uh, we'll take your site down um, unless you uh, pay us money. In Bitcoin, of course. Um, so I, I've seen the passwords, so it's, it's um, oh god, it's username, it's uh, admin and the password is admin. Or it's admin and the password is one, two, three. I, I can show you the slides, it's, it's, it's just stunningly stupid. Because the guy manufacturing the device doesn't have security online and wants the pop-up sprinkler to work really well or he wants the chlorine filter or he wants whatever it is to do well. It's not his business to do security. Um, Over-the-air patches don't happen. Um, you multiply that by the number of devices and it's really scary for DDoS attacks. Um, and we haven't got, we've gotten better as a networking community in handling DDoS, but we don't have it well um, in all of this. And what we haven't seen yet is the ransomware on things. But sometime in the next year, you won't be able to start your car unless you pay the bitcoins. Just gonna happen. There's a password on your car's intelligence is one, two, three. The privacy implications are staggering. When information is being captured by the thing, and all of these things uploaded to the cloud. So Todd and I were talking about he, he got some Alexa devices. Um, and um, thank God he hasn't activated it. I was at a, um, <coughs> yes, um, I was at a meeting a year ago. Some of the, uh, the folks, from, as they say, a small online bookseller um, um, were um, uh, saying, you don't want to know what we do. But in fact, they have built a mental map of things that you have because then you use pronouns. And every time you use a pronoun, you have to disambiguate that pronoun and try to figure out what the person's referring to. So they're taking all the data across all these devices, using that to build a map of you. And, um, um, there's lots of, so um, who owns that knowledge? Um, who owns the data in the cloud? So you have a Samsung device that uses Alexa. It's sending everything up in the cloud to understand it. Who owns that data? Samsung? Alexa? Amazon? Not you. That's what the only thing we know for sure. Not you. Um, so your mind is not owned by you anymore, it's being owned by Alexa. Um, and then what can the government ask? I am sure that um, Amazon is being pressured a lot by the US government, and by other governments too, to um, add another set of questions that Alexa can answer. That can help figure out, you know, are you likely to be X, Y, or Z on the basis of that? Um, we're particularly vulnerable in this. Um, um, because um, um, at least on the campuses I've been, um, a researcher can buy a device. And, uh, and it's not even necessarily on the network because it may be using a low power network or a cellular network, but it comes back around on that. Um, and there's no life cycle management. Um, and yet we're not going to stop the acquisition of this because they're intrinsic to so much of our research. So, wind up, predictions. Um, sovereign identity will find a small place in the internet identity realm. Um, we're already starting to think about blockchains for small circles of trust. Um, so we have this problem of, um, since we got rid of PKI, we have trust routes that are PKI certificates one per federation. Right now they're self-signed. Now can I switch that to a blockchain and have the community sign and vet those things? That would be an actual improvement over what we do today. So we'll find some ways of doing this. Um, we'll, do, we'll do consent. Um, um, 
uh, and uh, users will get better front end privacy. Um, if only because, again, if, if Adobe is about to do this for half a billion users, we're, we're going to see that. Um, um, and um, again, the, where mischief will happen is in that purpose field, where I can say, well, I'm doing a purpose similar to what this cookie is okay for, or what you release the information for. And so um, that's where the mischief will happen. Um, uh, IoT security and privacy threats. It's going to be like Y2K. I mean, some of us remember Y2K. Well, um, it's going to be Y2K every day. Um, it's just that, that pernicious. Um, um, profiles will continue to get fatter um, to cover more concerns. But I don't think we're ever going to move into the land of, of auditors, at least not in our community. They're expensive. We're going to do self-asserted and we have the wall of shame. Should you ever do anything, we'll put you up there on the, in the chronicle of higher education that you didn't do something right and uh, that will scare you. Now, and lastly, um, this is uh, perhaps the worst, is that um, we're going to, will any of these things stop people from sharing too much with Alexa, et cetera? And no, um, convenience will win it out over privacy. Just the nature of us human beings. I think that's the last, yeah. Any, any other questions? Thank you for coming. Thank you.